All right, seven o'clock, I call the meeting to order. And I'll turn it over to you, Alice. Okay. Thank you. So this is a meeting of the advisory budget committee along with the select budget. And tonight, first I know the cemetery trustees, and I understand they're not coming. Mm -hmm. um, then second, we have the agriculture commission. Is somebody here representing them? Mm -hmm. No, Eric's not here either. All right, then why don't we go right to the Energy Commission? Hi, Sharon. <laughs> you want to come up and talk to us about what you, you guys can, need for I can do it right now. That's good. <laughs> okay. I'll keep one of these for me. Sure. Just one on each. Hi everyone. Hi, it's not raining at the moment, just in case you want to know. <laughs> okay. Fix it. I'll well, fix it. don't say a word. <laughs> First of all, I want to say that we have not spent the money that was generously given to us last year. And we haven't spent it because it takes a pile of research to know how to spend it. And so we've been doing research. Uh, based on our report by, um, oh, what's his name, uh, Clay Mitchell, uh, advising us to go for the lighting, go for the lighting first, because that is the most uh, steady market right now. Mm -hmm. The value doesn't change that much, and so forth. So we've been doing that, and we've been looking for a way to do our, one of our main goals, which is to help the towns, the town save money on energy kinds of resources like lighting. And you'll notice we all have, we have fluorescent lights here throughout and they're nice and comfortable and so forth, but they don't last that long, not nearly as long as LED lights do. LED lights are a little bit uh, brighter, so I don't know, you might not even need quite as many as you have fluorescent lights, and the good part is that you can um, put the LED lights right into the same fixture. And we had heard from one uh, group of people that came through that we wouldn't have to take the ballast out, we could just leave it in there, but we have an example of an LED light at the foot of the stairs on the first floor, and uh, he was uh, one of the electricians that was coming to talk with us. He was reaching around up there trying to, trying to avoid the ballast that was there and get the ballast in that you have to have in for the LED lights. And he, he advised us it would be easier, just take it out, you know, and then I can do a better job. Because I guess he already thinks he's getting a job. We have, uh, we have uh, talked with uh, several electricians and uh, we've talked with several Companies, the New Hampshire Co-op uh, has a what looks like a pretty good deal, where you get about 50% off, really, of what it would cost to install them yourself, to buy them, and, and install them yourself. And they come and they do it in a day or two. You know, it happens quickly. They can do them all at once, so you're not bothered with. Trying to think, oh, let's see, that was a little dim. I probably need to take that one out next week. You know, things like that. And he does, uh, one electrician has a, a way, a place to dispose of the fluorescent lights because one of their main goals at the New Hampshire Co op is to get people to use LED lights. Everybody is using them if they possibly can. And so, it might save us a lot of money in the short run, but also in the long run, because they last at least twice as long as the fluorescent lights do. So anyway, that's probably enough on that, but uh, we uh, also have just received a, a, a proposal from Revision about putting um, solar energy on the roof of this building panels. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was just on the roof, but then I looked at their diagram, it looks like it, it, they're thinking of putting it out uh, from the building rather than on the building. 
I don't know. I couldn't couldn't read the diagram very well. It's very plain, but I'm not a diagram reader. So I just got it today. And uh, we'll be looking at that. And then uh, we, there's also possibility that the town could do everything themselves if they want to. It'll cost you money. We'll tell you that. But uh, uh, it's not as good a deal, really, uh, in terms of money. So we're working with those three ideas. Julie has been incredible. She helps us so much. I'm glad to know you. <laughs> you know, because we're all amateurs at this, and she knows lots of stuff. So we have looked also toward uh, the capital fund, capital improvement plan, capital improvement fund, at her suggestion. And she even wrote a letter to see if they would even entertain the replacement of lights with LED lights as a as a capital kind of expense. So it's up to us to find out all the good ways to tell them that this is going to save everybody money, everybody's going to like it. So anyway, uh, another project that we had going on for quite a while is uh, the swap shop. And we thought at first, we're going to pick the swap shop up and set it over here. <laughs> and uh, no, <laughs> uh, Toby is the new manager there, and he had some different ideas. And I can pass this around you sort of uh, look at this diagram and see what he has in mind, but basically uh, he, he wants to make the uh, waste, uh, what, the metal waste building and the swap shop be right side by side. Actually, the, the swap shop looks to me like it would be part of that building. And then there's an extent, extended area where um, People can bring their stuff. And we were looking at, we were saying, well, you know, that's $5,000 that was given to us by the town to work on this. And we want that money to go for energy saving, not just building materials. So I think that Toby knows that. He understands that. And we're going to talk some more about how can we do that. So heating the, build, the building and the uh, there are several ways to do it, but uh, some are more expensive than others. And when you get there and you see what a small area it is that he wants heated, uh, you begin to think, do we really need one of these great big pumps, you know, to, to do everything? Or do we need something smaller and cheaper? So we're going to talk to him about it and see how we might do that. We want everything well insulated because it's, that's number one, you know easiest thing to do. And uh, the lighting we'll take care of out of our budget for him. And uh, But he's very excited about it. we got to name it after him. The swap shop. You know? <laughs> okay. Uh, and then um, the third thing that we've been working on, um, we learned that the, the office in the, in the uh, recycling center is either hot or cold, unless you turn on a, a window air conditioner and keep it cool in the summer. And it's just not a very pleasant place to work. And uh, <coughs> it costs money to plug in those air conditioners. And maybe if we, and we're getting somebody where we want to do a door test. Don't ask me to explain the door test. I don't understand it very well, but it's a test to see where the insulation should go, should if we insulate that office and the, the hallway. And uh, so I think we should probably do the test for that. And it's been recommended to us that we do the test for everything you know, that we want to do and include heat energy along with light energy. But it may be a little bit too much to do it for all the buildings this year. So. Uh, we also have some money for outreach and contingency operating funds and so forth. And uh, we are also engaged in writing a warrant article that sees if the town wishes to learn a lot more about uh, offshore energy and how we might benefit from an offshore 
energy platform. And oh, we're talking about in wind energy. And uh, I understand from a poster that I'm having made anyway, that you can stand on the shore, and by the time you're looking at the Isles of Shoals, and even a little bit beyond it, which is about six to eight miles out, the, the sails that you're seeing on a sailboat begin to look very small. They're not one of these great big things that you think you're going to see exactly the same no matter where you are. And so that's kind of an important concept because people care about our little tiny coastline and, and the view, and uh, they don't want that destroyed. And so it's also important that we're on the Atlantic Flyway for birds, and they can get caught up in the blades of the wind energy platform. So um, there's a lot more to do on that, to learn about it. And we are planning programs uh, for the public to learn more about it. In fact, one of them is taking place, unfortunately, on what we found out is Halloween night in Lee on the 30th at the church. And we'd like to invite all of you to come. And it's at 7 o'clock, though Halloween is over at 7. So you could just drop your kids off, let them eat candy until they're stopped, and then come to the, come to the uh, energy program, which is at the church. And we have one of our locals uh, talking to us about ways to save energy that don't cost you any money. Well, not very much. And also, uh, Mr. Rao from Hollis, New Hampshire, is coming, who's had a lot of success in his town saving energy in various ways. And then someone representing Revision is coming to talk, which is one of the energy companies that we've been working with this year. So I think it'll be interesting. It'll be a panel. There's time for questions. And uh, it's the beginning of probably oh, two or three more of these. Uh, we're not going to impinge on Thanksgiving, however, and Christmas, so it'll probably be after the first of the year. Uh, so the budget request that we have this year, which I need to get to, uh, we didn't ask for very much money because we have all this money to spend and we want to spend it and we don't want to worry about spending more when we're, we're really very busy with the things that, out, that I outlined. And uh, we thought that outreach activities should be a focus for 2018 and we should do a lot more of that. And it doesn't cost very much money, usually, to do outreach. And uh, it's fun. We enjoy it. You can come and help winterize the library or something. We've done that for a couple of years. And uh, also on whatever operating costs we have. So we only asked for $1,500. And again, Julie helped us think that through and thought maybe we could get by with not very much money for the next year. So thank you very much for listening. You know how I like to talk. So I'll stop, unless you have questions. How's David? How is David, your husband? As far as I know, he's all right, but we're having the worst time in our marriage because we're supposed to be getting ready to vacate our house and move into a much smaller place. And he says, oh, let's just wait until we really know we're going to move. Well, then they give you a couple of months, and I'm saying, oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the household picture. So, Eric, how about you? How about me? Yeah. Can I, hey, use, can I use the... You oh. may. You can use whatever you want. Uh, sorry, I missed the last meeting, but I had two other engagements at the same time on the same night, so I didn't make it. But essentially, the Ag Commission is asking for $1,000. Uh, we have around $4,500 in the budget right now. And the farmer's market has about 1700 I guess. And those are accumulating funds, but um, we have talked for years since the last master plan it was in the last master plan one of the things that we wanted to do was uh, sort of morphed into an informational kiosk if you will or some sort of informational center uh, for
for people in the town. Uh, started up the concept was to have a welcome wagon for Lee residents here on agriculture. We said, well, if we're going to do it for agriculture, let's do it for all the commissions and committees. Because uh, people are constantly asking about conservation, where are conservation lands, where can you hike, where can you do this, where can you do that, uh, recreation stuff. So that's been on the plate for a long time. It's sort of been on the back burner, though, because we're waiting for the select board to make a decision about the town center. And that would depend on where we want to put or what that depends on is um, where we put this thing. So right now we're actually leaning not towards the town center but maybe down at Little River Park because that has a lot more people and, and have some some sort of a informational, well, I'm going to call it a kiosk, but center uh, that focuses on all of the different commissions in town and all of the materials that they have, informational materials they have for the townspeople and for people to come to Lee. So uh, we've been sort of keeping that on the back burner as, as a project and I'm not sure of the cost. We're actually talking about that at our next meeting next week uh, to try to come up with some costs of, of what we're envisioning. There are a couple of other projects. Uh, we normally have to have a little bit in the bank for the Lee Fair. Um, we have a project in the spring uh, because of the chicken barbecue and, and pig roast. Uh, in the spring we have been doing a, a fundraising campaign breakfast uh, in combination with the Durham Ag Commission and Stratford County Farm Bureau for their Youth and Agriculture Grant Program. We don't get anything back from that. We do provide a few things uh, to make it go. Mainly manpower. And we now have accumulated a number of cooking machinery, utensils, whatever. Um, so one of the other things that has come up lately is, as some of you may know, we've been having a problem at the fair now because it's away from everything else. We need refrigeration. So. Uh, we've been thinking another back burner thing is let's look for some sort of mobile refrigeration that we can use for the for the fair barbecue but also some of the other groups can use it for refrigeration and we've been uh, renting a, a unit in the last few years this year <coughs> another fellow and I bought a unit and I'm not sure how long that's going to last but Anyway, so the thousand dollars is, is earmarked for some specific projects, <coughs> mainly what we do with this informational kiosk. Uh, and the farmer's market, which is sort of under the auspices of the Ag Commission, uh, is going to have some expenses. They've changed, sort of changed up how they're doing things and putting a lot more into advertising. And Possibly getting some some entertainment in there that may have to be paid for. Um, so they are probably going to spend some of that money down in the coming years. Questions? Sure. Um, I saw in the newspaper that Durham was considering reducing theirs or closing theirs because people weren't attending. I don't know, in terms of, I'm not there every Thursday. I was quite devastated when the Whoopie Pie lady didn't come back this year. <laughs> I have kind of like been on strike from the farmer's market because of that. So. Do you think you needed Whoopie Pie? Uh, <laughs> no, but I share them with other people. Okay. I don't know in terms of what, what were you guys seeing in terms of people coming, and is that a concern for a, you guys going forward or for the thing? market? I mean, um, good question, Scott. Because last year, this was the tenth year of Lee Farmers Market this year, um, and in the last couple of years, a lot of the farmers markets around the Strait of which I think there are 122 right now, um, or they were 122. Some of those have fallen by the wayside, partly because the newness has worn off. Um, People have to make a special effort to get there. There are other places to go. It's the weekday markets that have suffered the most. Hmm. 
people just can't get there in time. So, and then there's a lot more stuff going on at the weekend markets. Uh, so those have become more of a destination type market where people just go and hang out during the day. Um, but so the Lee Farmers Market decided this year we're going to try it out and see. We, they added some vendors, some craft people, um, because they thought that, well, some of the comments in the past have been, you need more stuff, you need to have more stuff. And people always say you need more, more stuff, but the problem is if you get too many vendors there, then nobody makes any money because it gets diluted um, if they're vending the same thing. And people like to have some variety. And so this year, um, Tina has been the market master this year, and, and she's tried to get more craft type vendors in and baked goods and things like that, which have been successful. So they did meet last week and decided, yes, they can go forward. And things are actually, I think the market was up this year for everybody. Uh, it's not that way across the state. So, or across the country for that matter. Everybody, I talked to some people from the USDA a little while ago and they said it's a, it's a national problem. Uh, so, it's just one of those peaks and valleys and you just got to keep changing up to what people want. Does the so, lady coming back? That, that I'll, I'll put in a good word. <laughs> Yes, Tina gave me the bad news. I says, where, where is she? And Tina says, oh, she decided not to come back. So I was like, oh. That's, the problem with that is that, and there are people, I mean, there are vendors that we've had that, when we started out, that now have not decided not to participate anymore, only because they've grown enough so that they're going to some of the bigger markets. Mm -hmm. They can't afford to spend the time. And some of the other markets, for instance, where Lee is an independent market, a lot of the other markets like Durham are actually sanctioned by the Seacoast uh, sea Farmers Markets. So you have to go to three markets. Oh. And most of the people pick a weekend market because that's a big market. So the other markets, for instance, on Thursdays, the Exeter market is a pretty big market and they meet at the same time or they, mm -hmm. they are holding this at the same time we are. Um, it's a difficult situation, partly because you have to have, it's all site specific. You have to have the right location, you have to have traffic, and you have to have what people want. And then you've got to have the vendors, for instance, um, well, I could say who it is because I'm not sure they're going to come next year or not, but uh, a couple of the vendors have said, you know, we're just getting. It isn't, we don't have the time, we can't afford to pay somebody to come, and we've got to, it takes a whole day to get ready for our market. Mm -hmm. We've got to get ready for the next market, or we've had a market the day before, and we're not sure what we're going to have left over. Um, and some people will just get burnt out and get too old. So, getting the new people in all the time is, is, is what we're shooting for, is to get younger people in there that, are going to be there for a while. Well, I made a point of visiting the market a lot this year, and I thought it did very, very well it compared did. to last year. It had some very good vendors there, and had a lot of, if you would, variety. I mean, we had a knife sharpener there, who stayed busy, and the baker was new and excellent. Had a good business. They didn't have the whippy pies. So. Huh? <laughs> well, I, I know, but I didn't see a lot of people going around complaining about the whoopie pie issue. <laughs> So, you know, but, so be it. Any other questions? No? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, You folks are from Waste River, right? I'm from ORYA. Yeah. And you're from, I'm from Community Action Partnership. Community. And you're ready right. I, I want to do ready rights because theirs is very brief, I hope. Right, Fred? Always do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they don't have to sit over the whole meeting. So Ready Rides is a 
nonprofit organization. We provide transportation to people over 55 years old and to the disabled to their medical appointments. So this year we had uh, 21 people in Lee who were registered with us. And during the uh, last, I refer to a year last, this past fiscal year, 17 of those 21 used our service during the course of the year. We gave a total of 95 rides for those 17 people. When I say a ride, that's a round trip would be two rides. So I guess we're at 47 and a half total round trip rides. We have three people uh, from Lee doing, the, doing some of the driving. Uh, so obviously people from outside of Lee are also driving some Lee residents as well. Um, in addition, uh, our sister agency, Coast, um, gave 50 rides to people in wheelchairs from Lee. And uh, so I think you have our requests in there, if I understand it. Be happy to answer any questions. We have them. Senator, the administration? After the it's after the purple piece of paper? Yeah. Administration. It is back during the after those moment. Last month. Administration. Can I ask a question? You gave us the number of rides. How many individuals? 17. 21 are registered. 17, 17 of those 21 actually used the service this past uh, fiscal year. And is that how is that compared to previous years? Pretty stable. We're looking for drivers, so if you know of anybody that has some free time, they can do it once a week, five times a week, once a month, three times a year. We're always looking for people that are willing to do some driving. Thank you very much. So do you have that posted somewhere, or how, how to contact you folks or whatever? It's in, the, 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 library library or it's, it's in the electronic mailing that goes out uh, every month. Okay. E-crier? E-crier. Yeah. It's right. an e-crier every week. Yeah. Every week. And uh, it's posted, posted, I think, in the church and other spots around town. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, who did you say you were? Community action? Oh, why don't we do community action next? Oh, well, I am new. Um, I'm Kristen Welch. I'm the director of advancement there. So nice to meet all of you, and thank you for all your support. Um, so we are um, requesting $2,000 again, um, since the same as last year. Um, Community Action is an anti-poverty agency. We serve all of Stratford County. We serve about 10,560 households a year. That's what we served last year. We provided last year over $10 million in um, goods and services to the community. Um, in Lee specifically, we, we served 102 households and provided almost $60,000 worth of service. And um, prior to the start of the meeting, um, this gentleman here was saying how there are homeless people living in their cars, and that is what we do. That's that's our work. So we work with people who are homeless. We work with people who are hungry. We work with people who are in need of employment and job training. Um, we provide early childhood education through Head Start. Um, we provide fuel and electrical assistance so that people can stay in their homes and not have to live in their car. So really, we provide a whole the whole gamut of coordinated services that allow people to kind of to break the cycle of poverty and be self-sufficient and financially stable and not um, you know not rely on the towns and, and things like that um, the bulk of the services that we provide in the are mainly fuel and electrical assistance we assisted we do assist people who are homeless um, but the, the bulk of our services for, for their town is fuel and electrical assistance and as I said that allows people to stay in their home um, so they're not having to do things like keep the oven on at night that are dangerous and, and not safe. Um, we also help people during the application process for those services. We help them budget so that you know they're not just getting a handout from us. We're you know working with okay, you can you need help with your electric bill? Why is that? What can we help you? do to <laughs> make you it know, so you don't have to keep coming back. <laughs> I'm sorry to interrupt. You're absolutely right. I am absolutely amazed that the number of people that just 
They're where they are because they don't know how to manage the money they have. I mean, if you ask them, they're, they're without food, and the kid's without food, and ask them what their cable bill is. And, I, I mean, it's just unbelievable. They're going without food to watch, to watch cable TV. They're going without heat to watch, you know, to, to have a smartphone that has 27 apps on it. It's just, they really need help in how to manage money. And we really do try to help people with that. I mean, we don't want to be an organization that's just giving people, you know, we, we, there's an application process. People have to provide us a tremendous amount of information to be able to access our services. Um, so we're not just giving it to people. They yeah. have to really demonstrate to us that they are in need of the service. And, you know, we work with them to make it so they don't have to keep coming back to us. And really, our, our goal would be that we don't need to exist because there is no poverty, but <laughs> that will probably not happen. So <laughs> here we are. Hoping. Um, so I don't know if you have any other questions for me and the, uh, the organization. Or? Yeah, I think it's a great investment. Thank you. So this, yeah, this goes directly towards it, it, the Lee residents that you're helping? <laughs> yep. Um, no, no, no. Yep. Oh, yeah, we know. Yeah, exactly. So all of the um, all of the, the funding that we receive from towns goes into our operating budget to help leverage the federal funds that we get. So every dollar we receive from the municipalities lets us leverage about eleven dollars in federal funding. So your dollar is really going a long way. <laughs> it really helps us a lot. Um, it helps the people that we serve. So. But you did spend fifty nine thousand nine hundred on Lee residents, on Lee residents last, year, yeah. last year. Correct. That's the value of the services we provided to you, to your town. Yeah, to follow up on Slip and Browns, we had the superintendent of the school district in last month. Yeah. And he said, I believe he said there was like six homeless mm -hmm. kids in the district. So I assume that you help them in some way if you know about if them. If we know about them, absolutely. So the whole, the services that we provide for um, people who are who are homeless or facing homelessness, um, we have where the we're what's called coordinated entry. Mm -hmm. So CAP is actually the single point of entry system for all of the homeless shelters in the county. So if somebody's homeless and they call, you know, for example, two one one, or they're looking for that resource, they're directed to us, and then we have this huge board in the office where we have all the shelter openings and you know who can go where and um, we work to, to coordinate that with the shelter. So if we if we know about somebody, we they would absolutely be on the road. This is a really busy time of year. It's getting cold. Yeah. People who maybe were living in campgrounds and tents during the summer, they can't do that now. So um, it's really, really busy right now trying to place people in shelters and and things like that. And then we also have um, a homeless outreach worker, and her job is to you know, go out into the woods and work with the police departments and try to find people who are unsheltered homeless and provide them with what they might need to stay warm and survive during the winter months. Um, there, are some, there are a number of reasons why someone might not be able to use it, be in a shelter. They may have a criminal record. They may be using substance using. So, um, for those folks, we try to do what we can to make sure they're at least safe. And we have really good relationships with the police departments in the, in the county to, when they see somebody, they'll call us and she'll go out and, and try to work with them. It's, so. it's, it's just unfathomable. We, we, you know, we have people that are hungry and we, we have people that are homeless and we, we have people that are just in deep, deep trouble. And it's just hard to believe that living in Lee because, you know, when you look around, it's so, I don't know, what do you say, just a high quality of life, that, yeah. you know. Yeah, so hopefully we're helping some of your residents. And well, it looks like you are. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> do you have any other questions for me? Do you, have, do you have a card? I do have a card, and I brought you some annual reports as well. I'll get it to my wife. Okay, well I didn't. Just, 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 just
I do sometimes. Oh, wow. <laughs> if, if she reaches out to me, I can put her in touch with um, whomever, okay. you know, she might, whatever she's looking for. Is your contact information in here? Um, mine is, or yes, there's a, group? so the, um, that's, oh, there we go. That, that's, okay. my, that's my information, and then Excellent. Oh, thank you. <laughs> well, I don't know, you know, when people arrived or anything. I don't know. Who, who are you representing? Meals on Wheels. Oh, come right up and talk to us, please. Do you have one of those in here? Yes. yes. Uh, I think it's in the back. Uh, um, I will just say, as you may have been prepared to cover this anyway, this is uh, the first request for Meals on Wheels for funding, certainly since I've been here. I don't know whether it's forever, but certainly for the last six years, they have not made any requests to the town. So. First of all, let me introduce myself. I'm Jamie Shang, and I am the director of Strack and Nutrition Meals on Wheels. And yes, this is my first time making a request to the town of Baden. Um, for a little brief history, I came on and took over this program in January. I come from actually Rockingham Meals and Wheels where I worked for 29 years. Um, one of the reasons we are here today is because the, this agency had been struggling for a while and that's one of the reasons I've come on to, to strengthen it and, and be able to help the people that we've been helping continue. Um, last year we helped 23 Lee residents. We provided uh, 3,156 meals, and along with that is what we call our support services, which includes the daily safety check. What that's about is every time we deliver a meal, we go in, we have our drivers trained to sort of assess the situation. They don't spend long in there, but they talk a few minutes with the, the senior or the disabled adult, make sure that the things seem normal, like um, Mrs. Smith is usually comes dressed and all kind of happy. Today she doesn't seem very strong, she's in a dirty bathroom, whatever. Things like that that we can bring back to our administration and the supervisors who then will work with the emergency contacts or their caseworkers or whatever the scenario is to preempt things. So one of the things that we you know, try to promote to people is that not only are we helping that individual directly, we're helping families because in this day and age, there's not very many families that can have a single income in the household. So everybody's working, so they're, you know, they're needing assistance to help take care of the kids as well as their elderly. Um, so we give them that peace of mind, as well as by preempting things early, sometimes we can keep things where we don't have to call in your emergency services. And you know, the other piece of what we're trying to accomplish with this program in particular is allow people to keep their dignity, stay independent as long as possible. Because, you know, nursing homes are important. They are there for a reason. There are people that need it. But we don't want to be putting all our elderly in there sooner than they need to just because maybe mobility issues, let's say they're wheelchair bound, they can't necessarily get to the store, they don't have local family, they can't necessarily stand at a stove and cook or anything like that. Those kind of reasons, that to me is too soon to rush people into that. Um, we based our request of her, uh, the fact of that of what it costs us in the town. Our program is also a match program and one of the issues that this agency hasn't been doing as well as it should and you know I came on board to fix is they were supposed to be raising local funds to match. The state and federal contracts give pace about 65% of the cost per meal up to a cap and then we we're supposed to raise the other 35. And they hadn't been doing that and that's why the program had been slowly kind of diminishing. We need to do that. And that's why I'm starting to go to the towns this year and talking to people and asking, not for you to front at all, but to contribute if you could. If you feel we're of value to your residents, to contribute and help us keep helping them. Um, I can keep going or I could stop with questions. <laughs> so, so from where do you work? I mean. From where did the Meals on Wheels come from? Okay, that's a good question. First of all, our administration office is in Summersworth. We have three, well, technically four sites, but three main sites. One in Dover, one in Summersworth, and one in Rochester. From there, the meals have been catered. We, we coordinate with the caterer because we want to make sure we get a dietitian involved and the meals meet one-third of the RDA and all that 
kind of requirements. Um, the caterer delivers the meals in bulk to these sites. We package it up there, and then we have a bunch of drivers that go out to the surrounding areas. So like your area is coming mainly out of Dover, our Dover facility. At those centers also is an opportunity for mobile seniors to be able to go in and eat there. So there's also some people that come in and participate there and have dining meals together and socialize, um, like in the summers where a location had bingo, you know, things like that. Um, but I will tell you that primarily Meals on Wheels, at least this agency, is probably about 80% homebound. It's much bigger demand than it is the economy of people. But if someone is, you know, we have an intake process to go in and certify them and check on their needs, see, we'll also make referrals if there's other services that we think could be useful to them, um, and that determines whether they are eligible for the homebound. Uh, if they're disabled adults, besides being the dis uh, disability and they're under the age of 60, we have to have income requirements. And uh, when I was just figuring out for another grant I was trying to get, I think I had, it was either 64 or 68%, I'm sorry, I'm blanking on that, um, of our clientele make under $1,218 a month. So we have a very high percentage of very low income seniors that we're helping and disabled adults. So you mean if somebody makes $1,500 a month, you can't help them? If they're over 60, I you can. can. If they're under 60, unfortunately, we don't have funding for that right now. Maybe someday in Rockingham, I had so much funding built up over there, I was able to help even those people that fell through those cracks. Right now, we're not a strong enough agency to do that. So I gotta focus on my core groups right now. Um, but maybe, you know, I was there 29 years, I'm here, not even a year yet, so give me time. <laughs> where, where, I'm sorry, where, does the, where, where do you get the food from, the raw food? It, we have a caterer that we contract out in Manchester area, and they put it together. Um, one of the reasons you do, we like to do a catering. First of all, is there's so many restrictions on food safety and keeping everything safe. Then, of course, like I said, the nutrition guidelines. And the last thing is we're doing, on average, I want to say, 460 meals, I believe it was, uh, a day. So like some people ask, well, why don't you use like food pantry food? Getting that much volume, meeting nutrition, you know, requirements and all stuff is very difficult. Food pantries have a lot of good food, but it's just, it's like a little bit of rice here that, you know what I mean? And, and you have to make it all unified, you know? So it's easier to do it with a caterer um, and coordinate with them. And, and like I said, right now, the one that we dealt with is in Manchester. Well, I can tell you, I have an elder, very elderly sister out in Arizona who, uh, we got a phone call one day that said, you know, she just wasn't doing right and they took her to the hospital and they said she's not eating right because she wasn't taking the time to cook or do anything else, she, you know. So we, we called Meals on Wheels and put her on Meals on Wheels and, you know, she just really blossomed after that oh, as far as getting healthy versus where she was when she just wasn't taking the time to cook anything or eat anything or whatever. So That's nice what the hear. program does is fantastic just from a health point of view and from a well, that's it. When we try to focus on physical and mental health, you know what I mean? Because it's it's partly about the food, but it's also partly like there's, you know, we're, we're about to do our annual surveys again, and there'll be clients on there that will say that our drivers, they only want to see all day long, sometimes multiple days. So that can get, become very isolating. So that's, you know, the interactions are very important. Um, just for you to know, too, also, I haven't had time since I've been here to connect with your welfare director, if you have one. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a problem relaying stuff out. Like, it, like for example, I remember the year after all the uh, flooding issues, some of the towns wanted to get some more strategic planning out with their seniors, because they don't always know. The good thing about our agency is that we build a real strong bond with these seniors, and a lot of times, even though you may know them from tax codes or whatever, they don't always <coughs> connect to their community sometimes, these more isolated ones, but we, they, they build a trust with us. We're bringing food to them every day, a very comfort, you know, basic necessity thing, so uh, they, they're they more receptive if we bring them, here's some information about this going on in your town, you know, here's that. Um, they're a little more open with it. You know, like we've actually, again, with my former program, we've coordinated with fire departments to get firemen in there to just kind of assess situations to help make sure that smoke detectors are up to date or whatever and stuff like that. Um, 
again, preemptive stuff, you know. So we're very willing to work with towns and welfare directors and whatever on things they feel like they want to do for their seniors and try to help them. So are you allowed to share the names of your clients with the fire department? Not, what we have to do is it, it, you have to go through the person, the client itself. We can't just give you the name, yeah. but what I can do is yeah. like, let's say, again, I'm gonna use Mrs. Smith. You're offering this, our staff can go to Mrs. Smith and say, we have this opportunity, would you like us to reach out and get this contact for you? Yeah. Or would you like the information so you can contact it themselves? You know, so, you know, it's 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 something we very much respect. So, like, we won't go do it for like necessarily a hairdresser or something like that. But emergency type things, yeah, things that are really important and can help the seniors themselves. We have no problem relaying all that information to them and give them handouts or whatever. Um, that's something I've always done because, again, our goal is to keep them as independent but in a safe, you know, quality of life way, not just keep them in a, in a home when they're not doing well or not getting what they need and they're kind of miserable. That's mm -hmm. not what you need for anybody, you know? So So can you put yeah. her in touch with yeah. our welfare yeah. person? Just so Well, not only that, but the fire department. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know that they do well checks, but if this is another way for them to reach a population that they don't know about. Someone's there. Yeah. 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 And, and, and I don't know how they feel about it, but I will tell you in some cases, we've also turned to like fire departments, a good example, where if, uh, uh, we're seeing someone's like in the, a bad winter, not ever getting uh, shoveled out, uh, fire departments have sometimes helped us, but because they also want to be able to get in easy, mm -hmm. you know. So we've often coordinated with different police departments, fire departments, things like that, and we have no problem um, send the, the you know my contact information to anyone you think could you know help this population out. So how what is your out, outreach program like? I mean, how do you know? where these people are or how do you contact them? Well, for the most part right now, well, first of all, I have an outreach coordinator that goes out and does all the assessments of their homes and, and stuff like that. Um, biggest percentage of our people right now, I would say, and Larry, correct me if I'm wrong, this is like coming from uh, other agencies, Service Link, uh, mm -hmm. not 211, mm -hmm. um, hospitals, things like that. Uh, there is some family connection, stuff like that. I, again, have not this, at this point gone and like beat the bushes ourselves in any way. Um, I don't know how much more I can afford to do yet until I get more revenue. So over time we'll do that. I just recently worked on, working on rebuilding our website and I just recently we did our um, brochures which I'm hoping to get printed up and get out to like the welfare directors to have and stuff like that. Um, so we'll have more of that out there. But I also got to, you know, um, be careful because I, I don't want to overextend ourselves and be able to help nobody, you know what I mean, and stuff like that. So I'm, I, I'm kind of building that pot slowly. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously we're not turning anybody away. We have no waiting list or anything like that, but I, mm -hmm. you know. So, so if there was a, an individual in Lee who needed your services, could they contact the welfare director? Yeah, they could contact them, they could, you know, um, you know, I can make sure she has, I believe Julia already has my information. Um, hopefully soon the the, um, the web will be up. But also if you called um, Service Link or the 211, we are registered there. Okay. Um, so, uh, or if you go on Meals and Wheels of America, we're also on their site, they'll just they'll yeah. down to that. So, uh, but I, I think outreach is something over time we still could do better with it. I guess is my bottom line answer to your question. I just said need to take it steps at a time here right now. A lot of the home care agencies too are also are aware of Meals on Meals and Refer yeah. and so forth. Yeah. They have a home care company too. Oh, so okay. Did you have a question? Could I could I ask a rather specific question? Oh, sure. Do you do you try to work with elderly people who may need something like the the wrist button or a dependent, I don't know, life alert or whatever it is? I know of probably six elderly people who have never even considered that, that really should have it. And I'm just wondering what the mechanism is for yeah. pushing that along, whether it's something like what you folks do. Yeah. Is that one of the things that you really look for? Well, we, do don't they need... we don't help give that to them or anything like that. Right, but, but what I have done in the past, I haven't done it since we've been here, is um, like Life Alert would give us brochures to hand out to them we and we would pass those along to them. Um, well, but to I, try would, to, yeah. I will tell you that that 
that one of the problems of that is that's as far as it goes. Yeah. Somebody needs to follow that up. My mother was a perfect example of that where she had, we got her, she was 97 years old living by herself. We got her one of those things and some of you knew my mother. <laughs> but so she just happened to fall before we had the ice storm in 2010. She fell off her chair because she was trying to do something and yeah. cracked a couple ribs, laid on the floor for two hours in the morning, and finally got to the phone and called 911. She had a thing on her wrist. And so when I got there, I said, and the fire department called me and said, uh, You better get over here, your mother fell. So I get over there and I said, Why didn't you just push the button on you? Oh, I have to send all, check all the way to Iowa. It would take them all day to get here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Tommy says. <laughs> yeah, but you kind of have to walk them through that thing. You do. Yeah. Somebody, so when we, somebody's got to do right. that, and I'm when, wondering who that is. When our drivers, Tommy does that. right. Tommy. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, it yeah, could be another issue. But however, with that, when our drivers are aware of certain things, um, like and that's usually something like a family member like yourself asks us to kind of keep an eye for this or or you know mention this like like we can't go and give them medicines for example but if a a, a um, family member said you know would you mind reminding my mother when you drop off the meal to take mm -hmm. her noontime medicine we can do that kind of stuff you know so it, it kind of depends on um, on right. what you specific to talk about yeah. but we do try to work with families where we can. And, and help things along. You know, sometimes there'll be requests from families that are maybe too complicated because, like, a route, a delivery route could have 30 people on it, and you're trying to do it in that two hour window when they're expecting you and keeping the food hot and safe. So, you can't do a lot of stuff, but we try to do, you know, different things that can kind of help with that. Uh, common one I always joke about is often um, clients will have a jar. The oddest things, whether it's pickles or, you know, something that maybe a family member dropped off that they like, but they can't get it open. And I don't know why they don't want to tell their family member that, but they'll ask the driver to open the chat for them so they can have it later. You know, so different little tasks like that will do, but it, like I said, it depends on, there are some limitations as rules with our contracts of things, you know, like, like I said, we can't give medicines or anything like that, but we can remind them, did you take it? So yeah, so there's so this eyes, possibility. Which is really good. Yeah. yeah. And and like I said, the other thing is just yeah, if if if, if we know something is a concern, um, like we just recently I'm trying to think specifics, but a daughter had called us because there was something going on with her mom and she asked us to let her know right away if we see and I don't know if you remember. She doesn't answer the door. Oh, okay, she wasn't answering she was coming right to the door. Okay, that was uh, because there was some things going on. You know, some people we might like go to the next person before we check it, but this woman had a particular, you know, crisis thing going on. So like, the minute, the minute we know, so, you know, so we do different things yeah. like that to try to help. Okay. Thanks. So, any other questions or any other? Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time and I thank you for giving me an opportunity, and um, no, we'll be around helping stuff. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Are you both the Oyster River? Oh, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. No. Yeah. No. no. Are you with I'm the child of family who's with oh. Oyster River. Sorry. Oh. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Oh. Okay. So why don't we do you Thank first? You. Okay. Because Yours is complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, his is complicated. His or mine is complicated. No, his oh. is. There are a lot of questions. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. My name is Paul Soller, and I'm with Child and Family Services. Uh, this is my first, I'm relatively new on the job, and this is my first town funding, so I hope I can be brief and concise and answer your questions well. Uh, just a, a bit about Child and Family. I think we've been here before, so you've probably heard it. We are a statewide agency. We have 13 offices across New Hampshire. We provide care from neonatal counseling for, for pregnancies to elder care under the, uh, who are impoverished and at home. 
uh, we really, as an agency, pride ourselves, we sort of like to fill in gaps where we see them. So for example, we run a homeless youth program, but it's from ages 13 to 18, because that's, an un, that's a non-served population. Some of the kids old, older than 18 have some options, but we find that's a real at-risk population. Uh, we just started a human trafficking project here in New Hampshire, which would shock you that is how prevalent it is even in the state. We had just started it this year, and we've already had 34 cases. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's discouraging, but this is something I think we're the first in the state to do, and something that other agencies aren't addressing, or will address, or try to address. Um, specifically, we, um, we serve over 10,000 people, again, at various age groups. We, we pride ourselves in trying to do at-home care, so 80% of those people are, we serve in their communities or in their actual homes. We cover almost a million miles doing that. Um, and 90% of our population, to our estimate, is under the poverty level, which I think is about 24,000 for a family of four, and I forgot, a family of two, it's 17, I was trying to do it, or something like that. Especially elderly who are making it under that poverty level. Um, so then, turning specifically to Lee, the three services we've offered, um, um, citizens of Lee, are family counseling services, transitional living and homeless youth services, namely the homeless youth services of that, and, and adoption. Uh, we served eight people from the town of Lee last year for what we estimate to be about $3,200, or a little less than $3,200 worth of servicing. Just a word on the adoption program is preparing parents for adoption, like home specs. Um, here, I'll just read, I'll read from this sheet. Uh, uh, Home studies for domestic adoptions, consultation and mediation, post-adoption uh, post search, reunion coordination, including counseling and support uh, for birth parents, adoptees, and siblings. Um, we also, the, one of the other services is family counseling, which helps children with behavioral tra uh, challenges, problems in school, uh, problems related to divorce, step, uh, step family adjustment, family violence, relationship conflicts, emotional complaints, stress, self-defeating behaviors, addictive behaviors, loss, trauma, anxiety. So it's again, it's trying to get to the kids before they could become a homeless. That, that would be ideal. That's a home-based service to try to get to the kids before they hit the streets. Um, and finally, again, we have a youth outreach center in Manchester, and then we run a, a van service in Seacoast. So, uh, you, according to my records, there was one youth from, and that would be 13 to 18, from Lee who used our services. I don't know if that, I can't tell you, probably could find out, I think I could find out, whether that child made it to Manchester to use our youth homeless service there, or whether you know, that's an interaction with the van service we run around Seacoast. Because obviously Seacoast is too large to do one central thing. In Manchester, they, 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 those are the two congregation points for homeless youth of that age, Manchester and the Seacoast. And so we have actual physical presence in Manchester where they can get food, sh tent, well not, uh, temper, uh, shelter during the day, um, uh, food, as I say shower, they can do laundry, they can get GED training. Again, like the other agencies you said, you saw we leverage other supports, so they're given a full uh, intake form which assesses mental health, uh, substance, potential substance abuse, and then we try to we access other services to address those problems as we can. Again, specifically for the 18 to 13, uh, 13 to 18 populations. Just looking at my notes quickly. I mean, that's more or less in a nutshell. It's it's complicated. There are three big programs, but um, and our request of Lee was the same as last year, which was one thousand dollars. How would somebody in Lee find out about you? Schools, maybe. Well, I will tell you, and I would give it to you. Um, uh, we just had a, a woman who was studying film, and she decided she really was interested in our homeless youth project. She made a whole film about it, and I just saw it. I, I don't know if this is the answer to your question, but there's incredible word of mouth among these kids where to go, and we even have a nickname. We're called the 404, and it's kind of interesting. We used to be on 404 Chestnut Street, and we moved to Lincoln Street, but the kids, and this is 10 years ago or whatever, they still refer to us as the 404. So I'm just, my immediate impression is... It just seems like such an odd connection for there's so many other sir. It's such a long distance for a homeless kid that it's interesting that they... I think it's really word of mouth, and I think like you might know 
you know, and, and I've been to the, the center and, you know, I met, I was just there showing somebody around and a ki two kids were in the parking lot and while I was waiting, I was talking to him and one had been there since he was a little kid and he had brought his friend, you know, who had never been there and this was the first time and they thanked me for the service. Uh, yeah, I can't specifically just, answer. Just, we don't advertise, obviously. Yeah. We do do youth out, we do outreach, so you'll see our people in the streets of Manchester and in the vans around Seacoast. Mm -hmm of red jackets and all of emblazoned with outreach on the back. Yeah. And they go to, uh, I think somebody, the, 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 the lady earlier said they go out in the woods, they look, they know where these people congregate, where these yeah. homeless youth, and they seek them out. And certainly in Manchester, it's under bridges, mm -hmm. it's in corners of the city. I talked to one kid once who, um, they were renovating a hotel and they were doing it floor by floor, and he'd stay on whatever floor was under renovation because nobody was staying there, and then he'd slip out before the workers came in. So this is, and they know our outreach people know you know this they hear it in the center and then they go look for the kids and what they try to do is is, is uh you know it's a community effort we got a nice food donation from walmart for example and what that allows us to do is distribute food to the kids who don't want to be approached on the, as they're on the street with the offer why don't you come in and get some services and the other thing I think the outreach center uh, specifies is it tries to hook them up with their families it tries to assess what the situation is and then it gives them an opportunity and it has private phone booths so that they can call their family. You said in the beginning that uh, you give them shelter during the day and then what do you do, take them back to the seacoast at night? No, 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 I'm sorry, we, we, we treat the kids in the seacoast from the van and the van only, the kids who are in Manchester from the day center. Uh, so I'm not sure our hours, I mean 10 to 5 or 6. And they can have shelter during those times, but they leave at night. And I asked the counselor what happens to them then, and she says, I don't know. New Hampshire doesn't have a homeless shelter for, a permanent homeless shelter for these, the kids of this age group. There's a, a permanent facility. And then you don't want those kids going to the 18 and over facilities because then their, their new behaviors can become all the more entrenched and they're exposed to a population 18 and up who've mastered these skills that you're trying to keep them from. But, but yeah, uh, the counselor says that after 6 o'clock we shut the door and <clears throat> out they go. Are there any estimates on the numbers we're talking about? Basically, oh, the kids in, 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 out of the youth center? We, I think we serve like 5,000 kids come and go. It's hard. And I, um, that's, um, that's also, that's repeated kids. And I think that's also the street, um, that's also the youth, the, the van outreach. So they'll hit a cluster of kids and they'll talk you know, it that way. I, I can try to get, that's a number I ought to know, but, but so I don't right. know. Just, just trying to get a feel for how, but, how uh, bad it is. Well, you know, a lot of it's temporary, I think. A lot of it's pure, true homelessness as you think of it. A lot of it's running away for a week. And that's, that in a lot of ways, when I was talking to counselors, one of the populations you want to hit, you want to hit the kid who's just gotten mad is just left for a week for whatever temporary reasons, you need to get them back in. Uh, and that's a lot of the work they do. And so then they disappear and we don't know that it's a success story because we've merely been the, the place where they bottomed, bottomed out. You know, and then some kids obviously, again, having gone there a couple of times, have real either addictive or mental health issues and we, you know, we can point them in the right direction, but have you seen one of the things that the state, I think, has started to do in terms of addressing the mental health needs? There's been a reduction in terms of the number of beds and stuff like that, but they seem to be turning that around. Are you seeing any of that from your counselors in terms of better services available to these kinds of people? I can't answer that question intelligently. Okay. I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't talk to, to the counselors well enough. And so, for example, the... Um, the mental health counselors we have, we have two social workers who do intake and do help with some mental health counseling, but they're not, <clears throat> excuse me, they're not therapists. They will, they will refer to the state, okay. to state, and I don't, I don't know, I haven't heard them talk about the resources being greater or yeah, less than. Okay. Almost done. Anybody else? More questions now? All right, well, thank, thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Oh, that is, that would be useful, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, the pre it's, pre it's present for you. <laughs>
Thank you. Have a good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Last one? Last one. Sorry. <laughs> no problem. So I'm Matt Glode. Uh, you know that I'm the Voice Review Association. I'm pretty sure you guys know what we do, but um, so I guess, you know, where would you like to start? Would you like to know? Oh, yeah. You know, this is a tricky one. Where's his? They're actually. Oh, uh, they're in the compounds. They're in the compounds. Thank you. Because I kind of. Oh, they're commission? Recreation. Oh. Recreation Commission. So they're right before the revenue data tag. Everybody's getting used to our new system. There's a lot in there, so I can imagine it took a little while to get yeah. the right spot. Right. Right. So how are things going with ORYA? Good? Pretty well. We've had a we've had a eventful year. Um, a lot of changes to the organization. Um, it was my full year, first full year as the uh, director. Um, I started probably two months before this meeting last year. So just I was brand right new. Yeah. Yep, I was brand new. Um, and you're only really a veteran until you've been there a full year because every sport, every season has its own set of volunteers, its own set of challenges, its own set of facilities, etc. Um, so I've just finished my full year and starting to get into the to, into the start of the second. Um, so a, a few of the highlights from this past year, we built a brand new website, Ground Up, um, which has been really well received from the community that uses it uh, a lot uh, more user friendly. It is um, mobile friendly as well. Um, we started a new communication uh, platform that we utilize to create and send out to the community and that's on a set schedule. So we're trying to avoid bombarding people's inboxes. We're trying to um, more efficiently share information relevant to the organization. Um, we've also decided to move ahead with a coach and volunteer communication tool that we preset for them. It's called Team Snap. Uh, it's mobile related, so all of our coaches and volunteers have a much easier way to communicate with their participants, their players, their teams, their groups. Um, we have uh, added a couple programs this past year for the first time. Field hockey, amazingly, hadn't been part of OROA in the past. We started this past spring and it was successful. 44 um, girls playing for the first time. Did an ultimate frisbee program for the first time uh, over the summer months. I uh, just recently met with them um, and I'm trying to convince them to do a fall and a summer program. Summer around, you know, in our communities is a very high rate of vacations. So um, I think they're missing out on some of the population that they could service um, by offering at that time. And fall is the high school ultimate frisbee season. Uh, if you didn't know that they actually had one, and Oyster River does have a, uh, an ultimate frisbee group. Um, basketball saw a huge increase last season, uh, 100 more kids than they had ever had. Um, and for a, an organization that services Durham, Lee, and Madbury consistently, that's a, that's a statistical anomaly there. So um, it was a very, very tricky situation to have. We utilized almost every second of gym space midweek that we could have access to. Um, and that was with doubling up practices, so two teams would be in one court. Uh, Etc. Um, baseball went well. We had two Babe Ruth teams this year. Um, we hadn't had two in a long time. Um, we developed a new uh, MOU with uh, Lee. We have a new MOU with University of New Hampshire. Um, I don't know if you saw the Foster's article, but uh, they received a donation to create a soccer and lacrosse specific turf facility um, next to their um, football stadium. And as part of that donation, Oyster Youth Association will have a guaranteed number of hours for usage um, on that turf for our programming. Um, so that's <coughs> huge, especially in the spring season when turf is worth its weight in gold and we don't want to get out and do irreparable damage to Little River Park or Stevens Field or the Mathway Fields or Tibbetts Field or wherever they might be. Turf is what makes up for that and allows our groups to get out and play um, before fields are ready. Um, good dance program that was run by the UNH dance team for the first time. That was really exciting for the kids to play something in there. So they had a whole different um, feel of dance than our typical hip hop class. 
Um, this season we're launching a new approach to hockey, which I'm kind of excited about. Um, you know, I'm, my nephew's kind of getting into hockey, and I always saw hockey as one of those programs where there's a, a huge cost before you even know that your kids like it. You've got to get all that equipment. Ice costs a lot, and it's usually a long commitment. So last year our intro and rec program was a 19-week program, $625 for you know six to eight-year-olds. You don't know if they like it then. So yeah, so we're oh, they, well, they didn't turn anybody away. You know, it's really up to 12 year olds, but that, that's the kind of the core group, those eight, nine year olds. Um, so this year we have uh, a program that is uh, two, well, two and a half days a week, alternating Sundays as their kind of their cross ice game scrimmage type of thing. Um, but we're also starting an, an intro program, and that's just once a week, eight weeks. You can choose to do it again for eight weeks if you'd like. We have an equipment share now, so hopefully we can outfit most of the kids with equipment. Uh, and it's $150. So they can come and try hockey. I mean, we want to get, we want to expand our girls program. We only have a U14 girls team. We want to have younger kids participating, especially females. So I'm hoping that that can kind of wet their whistle and then lead into the rec program, um, which is a little bit more like your classic youth hockey program. Um, those are kind of the, the big pluses from this past year. Um, that is in addition to me kind of learning every sport as we go. Um, and it's, uh, it's been a busy one, but it's been great. Can I ask why you don't have tennis or golf? We do actually have tennis. We have a tennis oh, program. I didn't, see it. I didn't see it on the list. Okay. It's a smaller program. Um, it, it's one of those that kind of goes up and down. You really need a, a Pied Piper for those individual sports. Um, and we, we, have, we have a great coach, but she's dedicated to the high school. She's a high school coach, Nancy Bolkley. Um, so she, kind of, she volunteers to do it before or after her high school um, sessions. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's kind of like if you don't have a champion in the community for those specific age groups, it's tough to get their attention and to really get them in. Kind of like figure skating. We have the same situation with figure skating is one of these. We have learned to skate. It's always great, but not specific to figure skating. So um, she was sick this past Monday. They didn't have it. Weather's always tough with tennis, but we do have it. We had a summer program as well. Golf is one I've, I've been considering. Um, the closest course is Rockingham. Um, it, it, I'm unfamiliar with youth golf. I picked up golf maybe six, seven years ago. So it's a learning curve for me as well, but it's something that I, I would absolutely do if we begin to find those those local champions for it. Questions? If you're asking questions, we are. Sure. Can you run me through? And I'm just looking at the top numbers so you can explain. Mm -hmm. But in terms of the number of people you are going, you're serving between the 16 and 17, looks like it went down about five percent. Mm -hmm but you're asking for almost 3% increase. So are there less people coming, but your expenses are more? What's the, what's the, what's the So difference? there, we, while we have these numbers in here for 2017, yeah. um, part of what was new for us is a registration platform. Mm -hmm. So we now, we were using this system called Blue Sombrero before where yeah. every individual had an account and you can, you can go in and some people liked it, but the majority did not. So I've transitioned to what we call easy facility. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of a, you want to do a program, you sign up for that program. There's no account. Mm -hmm. You sign up and pay, it's done. Mm -hmm. um, so in the transition between those two programs, it's sometimes difficult to capture every registration that we had, had between those two and between the seasons. For example, our lacrosse program had the majority of registrations in Blue Sombrero, but yet we still had registrations in the Easy Facility. Same with our soccer programs and a few others. So those are pretty close, um, but they might not be exact. So the, the increase is you know, obviously just a request, um, but it is, we are looking at some additional expenses for this upcoming year. We just lost our assistant director in August. I've been on my own with some part-time help. We were, I was very lucky enough to have our intern, summer intern, be able to stay on. And it was his third summer with us, so he's very, very knowledgeable. And he has a little bit of time between his uh, upcoming new full-time job after school. So is the Blue Sombrero the, the people that kind of took your information and didn't let you 
get it back out. That was the one before that, oh, actually. That was the one yeah. Before that. That was, I, I think that was called Sports Manager. That was before my time. But, yeah. but boy, I heard the horror stories from that one from our assistant director that previously left. So um, with me being on my own, I've been relying a lot on our uh, accountant group, which is called Lexi Management out of, out of uh, Newmarket. Mm -hmm. And her husband, um, my liaison there, her husband used to be the uh, board president or the director for Orway way back, maybe 10, 15 years ago. So they have a historical um, perspective on the organization. Okay. But when I reach out to ask for things, uh, they're on the clock. So that cost has kind of gone, gone up quite a bit. Um, I believe that when they hired me, they uh, made a dedication to try to get somebody that was going to bring them to kind of the next level, which I'm working towards for sure. And I think there was a salary increase there from their previous director as well. So that's worth some extra. So is that the reason? One of the things that was just kind of popped out mm -hmm. is on the page five near the end. It says online transaction expenses mm -hmm. a little over thirteen thousand dollars. Yep, and that's so actually is that a fee. That's yeah. So when you have um, any company that does payments online. Mm -hmm. There are merchant account fees and transaction fees that yep. go along with that. You usually get hit twice. Mm -hmm. um, each credit card has kind of their own percentage that they have. And when we transition from Blue Sombrero to Easy Facility, we are actually saving money on those online transaction mm -hmm. fees. So I am actively trying to push everything to be online as much as possible, mm -hmm. either through mobile or through their desktops. So we have a lot less um, payments that we receive by check or cash mm -hmm. or in person now. Mm -hmm. So while those numbers kind of go up per transaction, we're actually doing better than we were with Blue Sombrero. Okay. Yeah. Good. Thanks. More questions? Uh, who was uh, it right before you? Was it Mike and Nick still? Or Nick, they... Nick was a previous director. Mike Gamash left before Nick did. Okay. Nick left leaving poor Ashley, the assistant director, on her own for maybe six or eight months before they hired me. They had oh boy. put an offer out yeah. to somebody. He had actually, their, his current company had upped his awesome. salary, so he decided to stay. And it, you know, my wife and I just say it was, it was meant to be because they had already put an offer out, uh, and then I came in after that. So okay. Initially, way back, I was working with uh, giving back with Kathy Pepler. <laughs> I've seen that. I still get mail with that name on every once in a while. Mike and Nick, and I helped run the rec hockey program and the travel soccer program for Fantastic. a few years. Okay. And now my daughter's 21, so. <laughs> <laughs> She's aged out of the program. Aged yeah. out, yeah. So you can be a coach now. I could be one of those ones that does it even though your kid's not involved, but mm -hmm. I'm too busy. <laughs> yeah. um, I appreciate what you. ages participate in these programs? The vast majority is kindergarten through eighth grade. Yeah. Um, every once in a while, we will, um, you know, kind of service the community when they ask for it. So, as an example, in the spring, um, we have a lot of people that come and want to play soccer in the spring that are high school age players, because uh, fall is high school soccer season. So they still want to continue. We had a U19 team, U19 boys team this past year. We had a U17 boys team this past spring, and we had a U17 slash 18 girls team as well. And they all came to us. We don't want to play for Seacoast United. We don't want to play for these other local clubs that, you know, might have either ulterior motives or cost a bit more. Um, so they come to us and, and ask if we can service them, and we did. So this is a question that used to get asked every year. So I'm going to ask it again. <laughs> when you report that 578 kids. Um, participated from the league mm -hmm. is that 578 unique individuals or one kid might have been in three programs so that counts as three it's the Hensy question you're mm -hmm. in, yes your, in memory Bill of Hensie. Bill Hensy yeah. I actually have all of those different variations yeah. in demographics so this number represents uh, participants so it could if Matt participates in soccer baseball and mm -hmm. hockey that would count for three. Okay. So I also have access to households that participate. Yeah. And I also have access to households per sport and then add those up in terms of all of the sports together as well. So if uh, one family has three kids in soccer, that would be one. 
but if they have three kids in hockey, that would be one as well, meaning two. So there's multiple ways to look at your, your numbers. The reason why we have those numbers there is because that's how many kids are actually participating in those sports, and you kind of have to look at it from an overall participation mm -hmm. rate. So this is registrations, not heads. Exactly. Okay. Are you still in the, used to be the court on the corner there, across from the- We are. Oh, the end court? Yep. Yeah, the court. And it's nice that we didn't have another, I don't know, padlock gate. Like Watergate, remember last year when you came, the whole padlock issue? Well, so that was good that we didn't right, have that. Cut, that's, that we know of, no one cut the locks. On the well, so. just this past weekend, oh, oh no problem, no problem, just this past weekend, uh -oh. same request, you and H Lacrosse, we've got a girls' youth tournament, can we borrow four goals today? Same person was going to go and pick them up, oh, no. and I said, I was like, don't you dare go over there before I get there. So I went over, I made sure that it was all set, and then they actually didn't end up needing them. They, uh, they purchased their own, so they didn't need to borrow hours. At the last minute. Yeah, so. Curiosity about, about the sports. You've mentioned a number of new sports and a number of sports that have seen some growth. What's done, what is not doing as well? Um, some of the most are, are pretty consistent in terms of, you would look at it, it might be down a handful, but it's not like a statistic. It could just be your, your demographics and how kids age out before they age it. Because you're down about 5%. In heads. Tennis is definitely down um, overall if you look yeah. at it over the course of a year. Um, lacrosse was up. Soccer is usually pretty consistent. Baseball seemed to be fine. Um, hockey's down a little bit. Um, in terms of our travel numbers, our rec numbers haven't come in yet. We're actively registering for those now. Um, we'll actually no longer be doing yoga for this upcoming year. Um, dance overall was probably a little bit down. T football was actually up. Um, we only did our track program one time this past year and it did not go well. Um, we were all excited to be using the high school track um, and they had so many middle and high school lacrosse teams that we couldn't get on that track until 7, 7.30, and that's too late for the, the age groups that we use. At the same time, UNH was redoing their turf field in the stadium, so that was construction zone. Their track wasn't available either, so we had our track program running at um, Woodridge Field on the grass during baseball practice. It was not ideal. So, and we only were able to do that one season instead of the two that we normally do. I was just curious because um, I figured something had to And we did volleyball for the first time too. So yeah. as I'm thinking through it and remembering the numbers per sport, um, you know, that's kind of where it comes into that point that I made before. I don't know how 100% accurate those numbers for 2017 are um, because I'm, I'm thinking through and most programs are either the same or up slightly with the exception of some of those smaller ones. Thank you. More questions? No. Thank you. That's it. Oh, sorry, one other question. Uh -oh. Are you looking for an assistant director? We are in the final stages. So I've yeah. uh, convinced my board to actually hire two people. Um, I think that's going to make the world of difference for ORYA. So I look really uh, closely at what the major roles and responsibilities are to make the organization run, run well, efficient, and for us to be able to continue moving forward. So um, we finished our interviews yesterday morning for two positions. One is Office Intern and Communications Coordinator, and one would be Program Director. And I would act as kind of like an executive director, um, dealing with all of our communities, looking after bigger picture projects, trying to find uh, you know, corporate sponsorships of any kind, if there's any out there, looking at grant writing, um, any major issues that we have, trying to create new programs. Program director would obviously make sure that programs are being set up, they're um, on track, registrations are there, coordinators are there, um, coaches are there, facilities are there, and then office intern and communications, which might not seem like an important job, is just as important in my opinion because they're the ones that connect everything that we do to the community um, and help really shape our public perception, which um, as you probably know, perception is you know most of the time um, what people completely believe. So, um, and that's gonna be the, the face of the customer service uh, as well. So the person answering the phone, answering the gen generic questions, 
um, and you know, it being a lot of people's first point of contact with an OROAA. Um, so I'm super excited. I'm hopefully uh, we'll have some offers out soon. And all the coaches are volunteers? Um, the vast majority. So every once in a while, um, a sport will hire um, quote unquote pro coaches that can provide services that we don't have the ability to. So a perfect example is a goalkeeper coach for soccer right now. They were supposed to have it tonight. I closed the fields. I had to tell the goalkeeper coach that they couldn't come. Um, same thing for hockey. We have a, a, a few skills coaches come in during the year, skating coaches, um, you know, skills coaches, you know, kind of their stick handling, uh, shooting, things like that. And then goalie coaches for hockey or where if they're waiting goals around here. Um, basketball, um, I put in the budget this year for them to have some pro coaches come in for basketball as well um, for you know, varying age groups and varying different skill uh, sessions. And then we sometimes will utilize quote unquote pro coaches for our coaching education sessions or coaches meetings at the beginning of the year to try to set them up for a successful season. So those are more like coming in for a clinic or whatever. Yeah. But for your coaches of the teams. No, no all, paid coaches. They're all volunteers. Yep. They're they're, all so the only exceptions to that when we can't find would be like our, our dance instructor, our hip hop dance instructor. He's a paid coach because that's super specialized. Um, he had been doing it for 10 years, Is so still, still Sean. Still there, Sean. Yeah. Yep, still yeah. Sean Middleton. Yeah. He's yeah. been doing it forever. Um, <laughs> the know. UNH dance team this year has actually, it's a different captain. I usually handle deal with the captain. Of course, we only did it for the first time last year. They've asked any chance we can get something because the only thing that they fundraise for is their nationals trip, their nationals competition, and that's what they want to go to. So I'll probably relent and throw them something for their service um, for doing it because you know it's such a, a specialized thing. Um, besides that, I can't think of any other coaches that we consistently pay outside of skills specific coaches that a specific sport might want. Have you had any problem getting volunteers to coach the teams? Here and there. Um, as you add more and more it, I mean, you're Things. always worried yeah, about sports. Every once in a while, you'll have to guilt some people into it, right. and that's kind of yeah. what every that's every, what we did every year. Every <laughs> organization that works with volunteers, you're going to have to do that somewhere. Right. Um, you know, our soccer program, our, our academy soccer program, which is all in house. I wish they had some more coaches. Um, well, sometimes they're scared. They think they need to be have a lot of experience in it, either as a player or a coach. You really don't at the younger age group. So that education piece where we're moving in this new direction of, of three staff members, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to make that a lot more clear uh, and provide a lot more resources for like curriculum yeah, for give coaches. Them, give them what they can do. The yeah, it's easier for hockey player. because we, we utilize the, the, you know, what they call the ADM model, which is from USA Hockey. Right. But same line with that, hockey, USA Hockey governs the certification of these coaches. And just to be a hockey coach in OROAA, you have to be certified in like three different areas before you can get on the ice, safe sports so that you are, you know what to do in a locker room situation where people are changing. Um, you know what to do on the bench. Um, and then, you know, obviously your background checks are through USA Hockey for Hockey. And then you have to do your age appropriate coaching modules. Some are online. But once you get past the younger age groups, you've got to go to mass for two days or eight hours a day and be on the ice learning what they want you to learn. Um, and that's as a volunteer. So we reimburse for all of those things. Yeah. We went to Dover. <laughs> the, the lucky ones will have one in Dover, but those rings right. won't offer them every year. So no, that's right. since we right. transition around. We'll have to see so. what you sign up for. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Well, that's good. Um, one thing I want to mention that I um, I might have brought up to you at some point, Julie, uh, or Randy as well, that area, the extra area that used to have the mounds, that is, I wouldn't say it's grass that's there now, it's yeah. kind of clover, 100% clovers. Um, that's something that we've been kind of discussing, presenting to uh, Town of Lee, that maybe we can help create that as a little bit more of a playable area, knowing that you also want to utilize it for your fair, town fair day. But that's something that we're, we're kind of internally discussing to come to you guys and say, hey, listen, we could give this amount of money, make this a little bit more of a playable surface. I don't know if it'll come through with some changes that we're doing with our, our uh, move to three staff, but something that we would love to be able to support. Silver for Park, 
where for five, six, ten years, um, there used to just be piles of stone. Oh, well, right, piles. over there. You okay. said, uh, right. yeah, they're gone now. Yeah. So it's flat. Flat. It's flat by it's, you. Know, it's you want to see if you can make it a. It's not really playable right now. Field. Yeah, it's it's flat and there's green stuff. I wouldn't call it grass. Mm -hmm. And there's you know the loam that was put down wasn't right. graded to a specific level. <laughs> so I wouldn't have young kids out there kicking around yet. Um, but now that it's flat and it's kind of a multi-use area, there's a little bit of a track around it. it looks mm -hmm. great, but it could be. You know the sheep didn't complain. No, no. yeah, that's what I was going to say. You know, know, the sheep. <laughs> you know? But is it? I haven't been out there. Is there still rocks in? You won't notice you know, them so much, but there. yeah, there are. So, I mean, I mean, it's you can't have. I wouldn't. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. It have. It have to have some work. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah, we were under the deadline. The current. What was it? The current use. Something from the state. We had to get it done no, and finished. The, I want to say the ATO, but that's not what it was. It's no, maybe it was the all terrain permit. <laughs> no, there is. There the all terrain permit. Oh. You know, had to get it finished, so we kind of like took whatever material we had there, just spread it, and then spread it, and then Randy put some seed on it and did some things. It's kind of squishy when it gets wet, so it's not. Uh, so. But yeah, there's a lot of loam. When you compare it against the other fields, the other field. when you compare it against those other fields, you know, it, yeah. it doesn't look good. But for a normal community that doesn't have fields that are like, you know, Gillette Stadium quality, <laughs> it doesn't look as good. So we you can really see the difference in that aerial photo. Mm -hmm. That yeah. that well, was really start that was really startling. Yeah. A, a, low, a middle school kid. Yeah. With his drone, drone in the middle of the park. Did you see that picture? I haven't. No. I should send it to everybody. Took a picture, and there's the beautiful, you know, multi-purpose field. Right. And then there's the other field. <laughs> <laughs> it's like and you're obvious. like, oh, so sod and irrigation makes a really big difference. <laughs> yeah. So, what could you play on that, just as a practice field? That I'm right practicing? now. Well, not right now, but like in the terms size. of the size. Because so it's, it is a little bit of an odd shape, yes. but almost every every field-related sport, so baseball is a little bit different, you know, mm -hmm. you play on a diamond, um, has youth sizes. Right. So soccer so has smaller. youth fields. Lacrosse has a youth field. Okay. So Go sideways or it, Exactly. Whatever. You just fit it in however it needs to fit yeah. in. Mm -hmm. um, but eyeing it, I think you've got a chance for – a full-size lacrosse field. I mean, there's dimension ranges that you're allowed to go in. Same with soccer. Um, it might be really tight for a full-size, but you could absolutely get a youth or a couple of youth fields there. Okay. So, for example, the field right there, yep. that was uh, our youth lacrosse home field this past season in plenty of space. Okay. Yeah, they, I don't know if you've been down recently, they put in some trees and some irrigation. Last time trees. I was there, uh, Randy was telling me they were just about to do that, so, yeah. And the other thing is we put in a kind of a pump house. Yep, so I saw that. A, so there's some other facilities down there that we put in to support the irrigation of that stuff. So Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I mean, we want to try to make improvements where we can and not you know, put that on the towns to do themselves because we're the ones, even though we're, we're you know, partially funded by all the communities that we serve, we want to be able to put our foot into that realm as well. So, for example, another thing that we're considering is completely – revamping the youth baseball fields at uh, Woodridge Field in Durham. Mm -hmm. I mean, the lip from the infield grass to the infield is like a ramp. You get a <laughs> ground ball off of that, I mean, it's coming. You're down to get it in a glove right into the, it's getting dangerous Just out there. Erosion or so, a couple things, actually. I met with a couple companies to give me quotes on what it would cost to really redo those. You. Uh, over the course of years, you put this special mixed material on the infields. Um, if you're a lot of money, you use this special clay and infield mix, but if you don't, you kind of use these bags you can get at the, uh, you know, any Agway store. And that's for like the mix that kind of absorb the water a little bit, but give you a good ground ball surface. Mm -hmm. Over time, when they drag those after every practice, it pushes that into the grass, and then the grass just keeps growing through it. So a mound just keeps building and the grass keeps growing through it. So that's how those those mounds and lips are created. Give those edges and yeah, so, them out. So what they'll do is they'll come in and they'll just re-edge it. So they'll basically cut it out 
then regrade it um, and put in a, a proper mix on there. Um, the biggest areas are typically around first and third because that's where the drags turn. So what they've recommended is instead of the grass coming, like if the base is here, instead of the grass coming here, they'll cut around it and this will all be dirt here. So that you actually have created room for that uh, drag to turn around the base without throwing it into the grass. That whole field used to be clay way back. I actually uh, uh, Woodridge. I grew up in Woodridge and the Woodridge yeah. development when they before they had built that. Yeah. It was just like a field and mountain of clay. Really? Well maybe that's why it, 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 it holds it, so much water. And it, yeah. Definitely. It's a swamp out there definitely. for like a day after oh, yeah. a rainstorm. It's incredible. Rainstorm or whatever, yeah. Yep. It's all <laughs> clay under there. That's why. <laughs> why not? Anybody else? Thank you. Well, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. And I yeah. appreciate it. Yeah. Hopefully, we won't be that much longer. Enjoy the rest of the night. <laughs> thank you. Me too. Yes. Minutes. Did everybody need the minutes? Do you have? Oh, that's all right. We can do it next time. Okay. We'll just do it next time. Um, something I want to mention about the Meals on Wheels. Um, our current guidelines for funding social service social service agencies says that if an agency is new to the town, it goes on a separate warrant. That's it. Um, so I guess that's something that the board can discuss. Certainly, it's a the guidelines that the board adopted, um, but it would be up to the board, I guess, as to whether they want to. Do that with Meals on Wheels this year, or just bring so them new to the town? Do you mean this is the first time they this is the first time the they request the funds? Yeah. Because they well, never leave from let me, ever. Let me back up a minute. Assuming that they are approved for funding, new agencies go on warrant article. Um, again, unless the board wants to discuss it and make some different decision, but that's the current. Social service, social service agency guidelines that we have. Hmm. So. And they don't get any county funding, right? I, I don't know. Because that's another one of our rules. If they don't, if they get county funding, we don't fund them because we're already actually supporting them. I actually, I think they probably don't do. remember seeing them. Would CAP get county funding? CAP gets federal. Because it's considered double dipping. We're already paying for their services already. There was a couple places that came to us years ago that we couldn't consider them because they were covered by the, the county. But whatever. Because we give money to the county, is what you're saying? And the county supports them. We don't them. give it, they county. take it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they take it. No, we have to give it to them. <laughs> it's um, not like we have to give it to them. But it's not important. But it's considered like double dipping. They've already. Got funding from the town. What if the town wanted to give more specifically to an agency? It right. can do that, can it not? Mm -hmm. So, maybe that's so whose story. rule was it that we didn't give to? Was that a, a town league rule, or was that? It was a rule at the time that because that was one of the questions we always asked. You already get county funding, so I don't know. Yes, we yeah. could take, it was a guideline. Guideline. It was a guideline to the budget process. Yeah. 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 Okay. That's something yeah. we went through, with, like you've been on the budget committee. I know for years. Yeah, there was, when you were, there was a dinosaur on when I came on. So. <laughs> <laughs> they are the only ones that get county funding. Well, I don't even know if they get county funding. Oh, no, let's assume they are. I mean, uh, uh, are they the no. only ones that we've seen tonight that would fall in that category? That's what I'm They're saying. Just, I, I, know, I was wondering. I bet there's others. Yes. We don't know when, We don't know who gets county funding right now. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do they provide you with financial statements? Uh, Meals on Wheels. Right. Or, all of them. Do all of them? Yes. Okay. Yes. I, it's a lot of paper, I so I don't make everyone copies. No, but if you want to see it, I'm no, sorry. no, I was just wondering if you had the information to answer the question. Yeah. Well, if you take a look at this, see if okay. they get county funding, and then we can talk about it against them. Yeah. We'll Are there any other new agencies this year? No. The only one we Who was it that we turned down last year? The Big Brothers or Sisters? Yes. Uh, yeah. They didn't come back. Well, yeah. Did they come back? <laughs> we turned them down. 
<laughs> they, hadn't done any services. They, hadn't, they hadn't done any services in Lee. Oh, so. really? Yeah. Well, and for example, um, the guidelines um, require public funding to be used if there's a direct benefit back to the town. So let's take CAP, for instance, the first agency that spoke. If they did not provide the services that they provide to Lee residents, and what she said was almost sixty thousand dollars, yeah. we would have to pay a lot of that yeah. because we are required to right. assist people. We it is not we have to assist people if they qualify. We can't turn people right. away just because we don't have money. Yeah. So they so went that's away. That's a huge benefit. It's a huge benefit. Yeah. The child and youth services is kind of a as direct of. Child and family services. Child and family services. Well, did it say how many of our kids were? Eight, I think. Eight families. Eight families, but just one. one yeah. But, you know, for example, let's suppose a child from Lee goes to that agency and they provide that kid with assistance, and so that kid does not end up homeless. That agency goes away. That well, same kid true. comes to the welfare office. We have, you know, again, we could very well have to provide assistance. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's why I asked him, how would a kid right. find you? And right. I was explaining about the outreach in the yeah. area. So. Plus, some of those agencies, the CAP people, they leverage federal funds right. too. So right. you're getting right. more bang for your right. buck. Money to, so I think the fund gap is funded by the county also. That's what I was saying. I think it is too. But that's what I'm saying. I will reread our guidelines. I don't remember that being. We'll take a look. That's just something we can't years tell ago. from the annual report. Everything's all it says is grant income for seven yeah. million dollars. Mm -hmm. well, those guidelines are just set by the slot meeting. They weren't set Correct. by the town meeting. Right. Correct. So, right. Yeah. Right. They can change the yes. guidelines. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's not a because it makes no sense to not fund them. And then have to pay more money right. out of the town budget right. to cover them by town welfare than you would have had to pay to the agency to cover them. Yeah, I agree. All right, anything else this evening? Yeah, I'd like to know where the ready rides request is. I can't find it's, it. The last it's the second like to last thing. one in your notebook. Yeah. Well, yeah. So if you, it's way at the end. Yeah. Oh, so if you if right, you it's before, handwritten. right before town clerk and tax collector, it's the next one right. Yeah. Right yeah. before town clerk, tax collector. Yeah. yeah. Right before Click, that divider. Right before that divider. So town clerk, tax collector, and go back one. Okay. Just, okay. Thank you. I just happened to be looking at. I was the, looking at it from in the place where the oh, others were. Yeah, <laughs> the homeless center for Stratford County. Last year they asked us for a thousand. We gave five hundred. This year they're asking for a thousand. This year they haven't. They haven't served anybody from Lee. What do we do in a case like that? Well, there again, they're there, and we do have. Again, we have people in Lee that are homeless, and it's. And especially right now, and I think, Mr. Brown, you know this, it is a scramble across the state because there aren't nearly enough beds. Not even. There not are not even nearly close. enough beds. Yeah, but the need has definitely ramped up because there is such limited affordable housing, especially in the Seacoast. Oh, it's um, but across the state, there's, there's nowhere for people to go. Yep. And so people tend to get into the... Um, Section 8 housing and they stay so there's there has just not been the turnover so I understand what you're saying well, I was just again, curious if they if I just want to point that out to people because but they're they're there if we had to send somebody there the resources the right resources. now right. really 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 slim out there to, to provide to these people it's unbelievable it's unbelievable families are poor I think it was living $24,000. I'm sorry? I mean, it's impossible. Yeah. 
So if we didn't give to them and we sent somebody there, they would bill us for it. Right. So we're going to pay for it anyways, one way or the other. So right. If we did have some. But, if we did have some. Yeah. But I'm going to guess that it's less expensive than putting them up in a hotel in Portsmouth. Yes. Right. Which yeah. I will tell you happened recently. Yeah. We put somebody up in a hotel in Portsmouth. It happens, yeah. Uh, there's yeah, nowhere. Choice, right. the, the church it's an emergency the and there is nowhere the to send somebody. There's Why has it become such a problem? Because there's no affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And so that makes the stock of A, affordable housing, that and much more desirable. Eight, section 8 housing is absolutely housing. full. There's a, there's right. a waiting list of years yep. to get into Section 8 housing. Yep. Mm -hmm. Section 8 housing is going to be And there you are with two houses on the high road. No. No. <laughs> the north, the minorities, you have uh, oh. further up the list you go. Uh, more, um, more, so more. Is there any other business? No. So I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. We just look at your, we scheduled the town clerk for the next, next meeting. Week. Right. Oh, uh, yeah. Conservation Commission is right before them, so I'm not sure if they'll be here, but. And remember, there is no meeting next week. Right. Next no meeting is the 16th. Oh, jeez. So that's two weeks. So in two weeks. Two weeks? No, three weeks. Three weeks. That's it? Three weeks. Three weeks. We don't meet for three weeks? The other thing that Julie passed out was the new uh, balances on yeah. all the commissions and stuff. Yes. So what was the cor correction to the Heritage Commission? What did they Instead of fiscal 17, they did not get 20,000, they got 10,000. Yeah. Got it. So really there's 31, but five of it is still the 250th, at least internally designated for the 250th. So they're working to spend that. The qu uh, one question about energy. The money that we gave them last year that they haven't spent yet. They have to spend they it. They spend it. it. I think Julie will take care of that. Well, they got $9,900 in the current fiscal year. Yes. 5,000 of it was earmarked towards the swap shop. And that and will the, get used. And the select board allocated that to the building of the new swap shop. Plus okay. more. So that's spent, essentially. Yeah. yeah, so 5,000 of the 9,900 is spent. Because it was 11,000 in total, something like that, for the whole project? Uh, almost 12. Almost 12. 12. So. Is it gonna look like that dry? Well, I think the wood's there. Yeah. I just drove by it. Just, <laughs> uh, there's a big garage door to bring in large yeah. things on the side. Yeah. And they're, they're taking the metal building and cutting in half the cash, what is it called, the coupon machine? Yeah. Right. And well, then yeah. one's half and then the other half. So the people that are there volunteering will have a place to go and get warm. Oh yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah. So they'll, all that stuff that she talked about from the current fiscal year will get spent. If they spend mm -hmm. it. Yeah. Or contracted. Well, they've got know, the, right. yeah. they're going to pour the foundation soon before it gets cold, supposedly. Um, but then they'll right. start the construction part. But they do know internally. It's not going out to anybody outside. So. Um, and what about the light project? Are they well, the lighting project um, is certainly more than the four thousand some odd dollars that they have left. I mean, that's. I looked at those numbers a while ago. Let's say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of ten to twenty thousand dollars to do all the buildings, or to do just this. No, building? to do this building and, one and maybe the transfer station. But right now, we're really focusing more on this building um, because. You know, the electricity bill is $2,000 a month. Um, but that's kind of what she alluded to, that the trustees of trust met and voted that, provided that they saw that, yes, it was going to be a cost savings to the town, um, that project could be funded out of the town building capital reserve. I see. Okay. As a capital item. As a capital item. Yeah. Okay. What else, what else runs on electricity in this building besides lights? Oh, that garbly goop in the police department. The, the one? Oh, oh, the computer uh, stuff and whatnot. Oh, and the computer, and the, well, could, plus the kitchen, the refrigerators, the, you know, the stove. Yeah. I, I just don't think yeah, that's what I know. I just think $2,000 a month is a lot. A lot. And, a lot. and that's with the co-op. If it was an Eversource building, it would be, it would be, more. It would be yeah. one and a half times that. Yeah. <laughs> well, she was talking about the roof. Well, yeah, and I actually, the, pods that they the, I actually solar panels, the solar panels on the roof, I actually looked at the um, proposed PPA, um, and they're talking about putting solar panels on the roof that'll generate just under 75,000 kilowatt hours. 
Uh, in fiscal per year? Yes. Okay. In fiscal 17, this building used just under 113,000 kilowatt hours. So it wouldn't and even, it would only do not quite three quarters. It probably depends on what system they put on, yeah. like what size system and so forth. I just have actually did it at my house, and it does almost all of my, I mean, my M source bill went from 300 and something dollars yeah. down to, I think, 10. Right. <laughs> and I, I, I got a lot of garbly hoop in your house. I got too. a bunch of, uh, yeah, well. I mean, we can ask, yeah, I got my and we will I mean, ask, yeah, but I'm sure that there's a reason that the revision energy engineers okay. could only fit X number of panels on the roof. They must have calculated right. it, yeah. Um, so. Well, it has to be, it has to be, so I have sold panels. Right. You do too? Yeah. It has to be a certain direction. That right. It can't so, be off angle. So if you're off angle, they right. won't, won't give you the That's why so they're talking about the So it would certainly help to have 70% of the electricity coming from the solar panels, but obviously it's not free. Right, what's the and, cost of the solar Well, panels? I think the cost of the project was what, $136,000? Yeah, like but you, there's the funding mechanism for it. It's, we don't need to get into it now. Yeah, there's a, there's a, um, but you own it, you lease it, got it. For, you pay for it for 20 years, et cetera, right. et cetera, et cetera. And is yeah, that, is that its life expectancy is 20 years? Or so um, years? They say, well, I thought they said 40 years. What about when you was 20. I know. I was wondering about the roof too. Yeah. yeah. Actually, Solar City, um, mm -hmm. who was who I went through, uh, funded the whole thing. Right. And gave a discount. Yes. A significant discount yes. on the power. Correct. That's produced. But they if took more is produced than they. They than took yes. the amount of money that the power company would have given you. So you miss that as a rebate. Yes, they get the that they get the tax incentive. Yeah, they get the they yes. get the, the so, money right. for that. For a big so building like this, it, yeah. You gotta look at that very carefully right. because it could cost you more. You might have in to put more run. money up front, but in the long run it could be much cheaper to get the tax rebate yourself. Well except that you know, can. I don't know yeah. about business. Well, you know, okay, the, I, I believe you can still there's an energy rebate the federal the, the company gets because you're producing power for them. Mm -hmm. There's a dollar and cent rebate. It's not going back to them right away. My it's, understanding is that the way these are structured for municipalities is we cannot get the tax. We don't pay federal taxes, so there's no rebate to give us. It, it's, it, it has to get grants. I got the wrong term here. I can't yeah. think of the name. But yeah. power companies get a benefit when you put in solar and sell, because you don't keep any of the solar. Right. You sell it all back to the power company. Right. And then they, but they get a, a, a it's a, it's a fuel usage charge yeah. for the green effect, the gas they put up in here. Yeah. See, that's not how mine works. You still get yeah, that. That's, that's why Durham yeah. put in that field over in there, because that company, Durham did the numbers right. and decided it was cheaper to let that company take that yeah. rebate from right. the power company yeah. than it was to pay the interest on, on the loan that they have to do for the field. Right. So the, the, the risk, and that's a that comes in this pal. You don't get the federal tax rebate right. that I got, but you do get that. I, can, I just can't think of the term off top, but it's a yeah. it's a rebate that power company gets because they're not putting so much green gas up into the air. I see. Well, well, we, got, we got a lot of not a lot of work it, to do on it. If you yeah. Do, if you do it with co-op, which yeah. is built on, co-op pays it because I'm on co-op. They give you a check right up front for what it is. Oh really? If, if and you, you still a, get a regular bill? Yeah, but my, my my electric bill last month was fifty three bucks. Yeah, that's what mine is. So you have a lot of garbly goop. <laughs> they, they, well, uh, more than just ever source gives it to pays it a month at a time for X number of years. So it depends on this building is lucky it's on co op because the co op gives you a much better deal. It's not point itself though, is it this building? It's not what? Point itself, no. like winter south. Yeah. No, that's but there's there's all sorts of different deals out there. Yeah. And, 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 and they, like I was going to say, you asked about the roof. They're yeah. totally responsible for the roof. If any damage happens to the roof, well, well, no, no, the roof where damage. it runs out. This right. is different. I mean, a roof has a life expectancy, though. I know. That if they need to remove the panels for any reason at the end of the contract or whatever, it's written, they have a contract, they write right with you that they will restore the roof to the, um, you know, most of them are really good about it. I mean, my yeah, inverter, they have all sorts of my stuff inverter like decided to eat itself. 
Mm -hmm. uh, they sent sent a brand new inverter out and paid for the company to come down and change out the inverter. Yeah, they're, they're uh, really so, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Most of the people that put them in the house pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, they'll get more and more sophisticated and easier and cheaper to do right. as time goes by. You know. Greenhouse gas. Greenhouse gas. Initiative or something. <laughs> You've seen the one they put on the uh, uh, okay, Tiger Falls Road, uh, where the yeah, Allen is really sure that. that big monster yeah, that's on a pole in the middle of the yard. Thing. Oh, yes, yes, I, yeah. Are we and done? Are we done? I think are we so, done. So, I'm waiting for a motion to adjourn. You love from the ABC people. Oh. So motion move. to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Can we get closed?